Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Hermitcraft where we're going to be doing a one-off project building our own custom contraption from start to end and I want to bring you on this ride as I've broken down a complex project into some simpler components. But before we get into that I just want to show you what I've been doing for brewing potions. I haven't actually shown this little room in an episode it's been on my live streams that I've been constructing this brewer setup by Rexstone. This is their design. It's unbelievably compact and it fits into this building here, which I thought was an interesting challenge to squeeze it in. There are eight of these brewer modules in total. And up the top here, when you look at it, you can actually see the ingredients that go in to each of these potions. So it's no surprise to find the oozing and infesting potions over here as well as we've got some instant damage and some poison. Those were going to be used in the dodgeball mini game, which I was going to bring back from season seven of Hermitcraft. And then obviously we've been doing some pranks. So having some brewers help us get these potions together saves a fair bit of time. But what I'd like to do in today's episode is construct my own. I have this idea to create a brewer setup where you tell it what type of potion it wants and then it fills up a whole shulker box worth and then gives it to you and that's kind of it. <laughs> but it's not the destination, right? It's the journey. And you're going to come on that journey with me as I've broken down all of this into different components that we're going to put together one by one. And I'm doing this in the hopes that maybe it will help you learn some tips and tricks for redstone. I see a lot of comments from people saying that, you know, redstone is like magic, but a lot of the time it's lots of smaller, simple things that you have to put together to make something bigger work. Anyways, we're gonna get started in a moment. We're flying over to the gaming district. I actually want to build this brewer in this area so that it can be treated like a communal resource. As I want to use some of these potions for mini games and stuff, and I imagine other hermits would too. And the nature of mini games means that you're probably going to need a fair few potions. So this spot behind the portal right here, I think would be a good place to have a communal resource. I was also paid a visit by Cubvan. I explained what the project was and straight away he clocked on to why I built it here. He understood it was going to be a communal project because potions are useful for mini games. And one of the first things that I've realized is I'm probably going to need a lot of help getting the ingredients together because there are a lot of different types of potions you can make in this game. Let's step back for a second and talk about location. I want to get our bearings here. You can see it's off in this direction that we have the neighborhood and cub band space. If we do a 180, we can see the paths of the gaming district leading over to Mace Race. And I don't think there's anything on this side yet. And it's behind the portal that we're going to put our brewer in line with the entrance. So I've cleared out some space and started construction. And I said that I wanted to break all of this big redstone down into like bite-sized components. The first one of which is just the selection array where we come to choose what type of potion we want to brew, right? So if I click on this button, then we can make a speed potion. Now it's not entirely clear which of the lamps are lit at a glance. Might take you a second to focus. So we could possibly put some signs up above and there's certain ingredients that don't actually have a corresponding item like invisibility. So aesthetics here are uh, going to change as I play around with different ideas. But the redstone behind this is rather simple. It is a tileable design. You can see the whole setup right here. We update the note block and that will send two pulses through from when the button gets powered and then when it gets unpowered. Here we've got droppers facing into each other and this is our T flip flop. This is where we're just seeing is the item in the top or the bottom. So when we power this thing, it's going to go from bottom to top, but it's also going to power a line of redstone across the top. And because this one here has just been powered, the item will stay in the top, but any other items that are at the top will get moved down. So when I go and press this one, okay, we have moved the one over there down and the one that was here up. So these comparators on top will activate the bulbs and the ones behind, well, we'll come back to this bit later on. What we need to do next is build a little more redstone because this is supposed to be one big array, but it has a problem. It is bigger than 15 and that is the maximum distance that redstone can go from its source. So this thing is separated into two components, but if it were one, when I activate this here, 
Okay, that redstone is not going to make its way down to the end. So we're adding an extra line of redstone beneath that will always get powered by these buttons. This is going to feed from both sides into a copper bulb that goes into a comparator. Then the observer detects the change in the comparator and sends a signal up to the top. And if we put a block right here, you can see that from the middle, it's going to power both the redstone on one side and the other. But before we see it in action, I just kind of want to explain the logic behind using this bulb here. It's really quite cool. You see the redstone dust gets turned both on and off, which is two updates. But the act of powering this only creates one with the comparator. Let's go and press that button again. And you see now it only turns off. So we're taking two updates from the wire and turning it to one with the comparator. If we come around the front here, you'll see that that lamp is on, but none of these are, which means that it works. If I go ahead and select one from this side, look at that. None of the lamps over here are on now. So this array is for how we select what potion type we would like. And then there are, of course, modifiers like glowstone and redstone. But once you've selected one of those using the system that I just showed you, there isn't really a way to turn that off again. So I need to come up with a sort of reset circuit here. And you know what? I actually think it's as easy as just creating this observer and note block setup because that's going to send a signal to the line up top that resets the droppers so that the item appears in the bottom. Okay, so when we press this button in the middle, it should reset it. Yeah, there you go, awesome. Now the gunpowder at the end can be used for any potion type, so it's kind of on its own here. All this is is a T flip flop with a copper bulb, so you can turn it on or you can turn it off. So the selector array is for choosing potions, but it's also got to handle the ingredients as well. This is why we have some new modifications around here, okay? We're gonna start with these four potions, the newest four, which don't actually work with glowstone and redstone. So when we select one of these potions, we want to disable the redstone or glowstone ingredient. And I've set this up in a very particular way. Let's go ahead and actually have one of those already selected, then pick one of these potions and watch as that turns off. And now we're not even able to like select another one again. And I gotta say that is really, really awesome. This is because this redstone torch powers these two droppers, sending any items in them downwards, but also then preventing them from being sent back up again. And it's simply turned on when it gets a signal from below. And because redstone can be awkward and quirky, this is the way in which we are able to detect that one of these potions has been selected. Now there are two more quirks to understand. One of them is with the weakness potion, which doesn't use a nether wart. So when this one is selected, we have to detect that and then create a new signal to go manipulate nether warts at the front. The key thing to understand is that we're just using the copper bulb to go above where this sticky piston is so it can create a signal to go somewhere else. Due to quasi power, we can't put a redstone block on this thing. So it's just a way for us to get the signal that we want. All right, so these other three potions are slowness. We've got harming represented by the sweet berry bush, and then we have invisibility. Let's go ahead and select this. It also relates to this ingredient, the fermented spider eye used to create the weakness potion. So we're going to need that ingredient. So if ever one of these three potions are selected, then you can see a redstone signal is created and brought over to this spot here, which pushes this block down. And that's important because these blocks getting pushed down are going to be used to send a signal out to select the correct ingredient. So I just picked like redstone and gunpowder. Those blocks are pushed down. That will help us get those ingredients to where they need to go. So if we're going to brew a potion that needs the fermented spider eye, then that ingredient gets selected as well. And I've shimmied it down to here because the other three potions are before it. So that would create some awkwardness if that ingredient was dispensed first, because these are all in the order in which they get brewed. And we are going to brew a whole box of potions in one go, which means we need nine times the amount of ingredients. So I'm doing my absolute best here to bring you along for the ride. We've created this array to select the ingredients for our potion, and that comes with some quirks for a couple of potion types, as we've just discussed. So these target blocks are now going to be powered 
to get those ingredients. So when they're up in this position, they're not selected. So first we have the nether wart and that will be followed by a golden carrot to make a potion of night vision. And then the fermented spider eye will turn it into an invisibility potion. After that, we have redstone to increase the duration and then gunpowder to turn into a splash potion. This is a total of five ingredients, which none of these potions will ever exceed. And that's really important because some of you will be saying that we could also include dragon's breath over here to make lingering potions. Unfortunately, some of the redstone that I'm gonna do further down the line becomes really, really tricky if you have more than five ingredients. In order to brew a whole shulker box's worth of potions, we are going to need nine brewers. Each one creates three different potions. And so you can see, you know, nine times three will fill up the shulker box. This means we're gonna need nine of each ingredient. So when we activate this thing to do some brewing, we're gonna create nine pulses to dispense nine of each item. So you can see this contraption here makes those nine pulses. It gets fed to the very middle of this redstone wire so it can go in either direction and the wire itself will connect with the target blocks. On the opposite side of those are these repeaters so that they can then power the droppers in front of them. And yes, all of these have cobwebs underneath for a really cool mechanic that makes the next step absolutely awesome. Before we get to that, I do want to point out there is room left on this side, which was very deliberate. This is so we can see how many ingredients are stored inside of our droppers at a glance. So if ever we start to run low on supplies, we got the room here to create some sort of indication system so we know to restock. But that's something I'm going to build properly a little bit later. Right now, I want to test these droppers and show you the awesome way in which we bring the ingredients to the brewers. That's right, we're going to do this with rails and a hopper minecart, and that's why there's cobwebs below the droppers. That's going to stop the randomness from ever shooting out an item into one of the blocks around it. So when this thing goes from one side to the other, it's going to reliably get all of the ingredients in the same order. Let's actually go ahead and give it a whirl because I put in some ingredients. Some of those, however, are placeholders. So we can see those getting shot out. This thing's going to get sent out straight away and it's going to pick up all of those items in one go. And look at this. We've got a placeholder for the fermented eye and for gunpowder, but otherwise those are the ingredients in the correct order. This next bit is subject to change, but remember how I said I want to keep you coming along with me the whole way we now have to power this automatically. So we need to find an event to create a redstone signal from, and that would simply be the end of all of this pulsing, right? So by using repeaters like this, we'll turn this into a constant on signal. And then over here, we've got a sticky piston that's gonna push this block out, but it's when it pulls it back that it's gonna power the minecart. And it's only gonna do that when this signal turns off, which is after we've created our nine pulses. So let's see it in action. Here you go, that keeps that steady signal. And when the nine pulses are done, um, well, you know, <laughs> we need to extend that pulse. There are always so many things to remember when doing redstone. It's quite common to make little mistakes like that, but this time, uh -huh, the timing is good. Out goes the minecart. And once again, we got all of the ingredients. So the next trick now is to send this out to where we're gonna have our brewing stands and bring the minecart back again. Did I say brewing stand? I meant brewing stands because there's nine of them. And around it is a loop with a little bit of redstone. The most important bit is this bit here because the minecart is gonna go in this way across the hoppers that point into the brewing stands and then it's gonna come back out and go along here again. But of course we have a detector rail pointing into this redstone that controls that rail. So if any items are still in the minecart, it has to do another lap. And if you're good at adding things up, you know exactly what's going to happen next. But let's go ahead and see this thing in action. There are our items. A moment later, the minecart goes out. And then it'll do laps around here until it's run out of items. So there goes the first set of items. Let's try and have a sneaky look. You can see things are working perfectly here. All right, and then the last lap, it's empty, so it goes all the way back to the beginning and it's ready to go again. This minecart is empty. 
Now, this is my favorite bit because look at the order that the items are inside this hopper. The nether wart goes straight down into the brewing stand, which is the first ingredient and the rest of them are in the correct order. Now, if there were bottles inside of here, the nether wart wouldn't have finished brewing. Let's say it did, for example, one of these items could end up going over here because another item has popped down, but that does not happen. And yes, we're still using placeholders for some of these items. Let's slow things down for a second. It's occurred to me as I'm explaining all of these steps, you may not understand how I actually came up with all of these, right? One of the things that's tricky to explain how to do is to have such a big project with so many different things you need to create, but it's about sort of picturing the start and the end of the process and going through all those different steps, experimenting, testing stuff in your redstone world and getting a bigger picture of all the different circuits that you need because you've got to bring together all these redstone elements to do the different steps of the task, which is brewing potions. And the next thing we need to be able to do is take out brewed potions and put in water bottles. So the water bottles come in from the side, the brewed potions get taken out here, but these are actually locked by the target blocks powering them. So it's the hoppers underneath them that actually shuffle out the potions. The reason it's set up like that is because we need to power and unpower these hoppers to take potions out, to put new water bottles in. And we can't do those two things at the same time. So you'll see in its default state, it is locked so that no potions come out. But on this side, it's not so that water bottles can always be fed into the brewing stand. So when we want to take out our brewed potions, we're gonna to wanna to lock the water bottles. So this gets powered first, and then we unlock on this side. So that gets powered second. Let's see that in action. So in this state, all the potions will be drained through this hopper go down to the bottom and get sent away and no water bottles will make their way into the brewing stand so it will be empty. But the next trick is that we want to lock these before we unlock those and that's why we've got this little repeater here so that this will unpower but it's also powering that one. So check it out, that one locks, this one unlocks. Let's just do that one more time so you can kind of see the order of events and that's what it's really about, figuring out the order of events and then using the redstone components to achieve that. The next system I shall show you is the first that I'm rather unhappy with. Also, my villager has an arrow in its eye. <laughs> oh dear. The reason I'm unhappy with this is because it needs two band-aids. And what I mean by that is additional redstone that compensates for the flaws that this has. In short, I didn't find the best solution for this problem, so my redstone gets a little clunky around here. But let's recap, we're getting all of the ingredients in order into the brewing stands. We can now control the arrival of water bottles and taking out the potions. So here we're going to detect when the ingredients arrive. The other side of that comparator is redstone dust so we can turn off this torch. Currently it's keeping all of these items in this side. So when there's items sitting inside of the hopper, they're going to drain over to this side. When the final ingredient leaves, those items drain back onto this side. And when it's finished doing that, we are then ready to activate this redstone because the brewing would have finished and we can swap out our potions, put in new water bottles. So when items first arrive over here, we power up our redstone. So that's why we use an observer like this, because it's only when the items finish going back in that we create a pulse. And this right here is actually part of a pulse extender. This redstone will be powered by the block and the repeater, as will that one. If we then go and put them like this, you can see that all the repeaters are powering this redstone. So let's put some items back into the hopper. It's when that goes up that we're going to extend the length of the signal. And it goes for long enough to allow free potions to drain out of here and then the water bottles can go back in. Sounds great, right? We detect ingredients going in. We've got a clock and a timer so that we let the potions come out after they're brewed, but it has some flaws. Floor number one, the minecart comes around with a nether wart and it goes straight through the hopper into the brewer. So that creates a pulse, which means this thing gets activated straight away. So here comes the band-aid. We've got an event that happens before that item goes in over there. So if we put a bulb below that detector rail, it's gonna get powered. We're then gonna use a comparator here so we can detect that with an observer. 
This will create a one tick pulse and we move it to here. So that sticky piston will retract the block for that comparator. This is what gets turned on too early. So we shimmy it out of the way. The minecart will then do its laps. And when it's done and it exits, it powers this again. So then the block gets pushed back when this timer is doing its thing correctly. Floor number two. If we're brewing a potion with just two ingredients, this clock isn't right for the job. If we're brewing one with three or more ingredients, it works perfectly. So we could leave it like this, but you guessed it, we need a second band-aid. And so using a comparator signal decay clock here, we simply extend the pulse length and then that's going to compensate for the amount of time that this thing is off by. It also means there's a little added delay for potions that have three or more ingredients. So I do want to come back and revise this. But we are now ready for the next step, which is sorting out the blaze powder and water bottles that are going to fill up these brewing stands. And that gives me a good excuse to leave the area, if only for a moment. So I've come over here to the witch farm, home of Goliath where we should have farmed up loads of bottles, right, from the witches. Let's have a look. One of these should contain them. We've got sticks. There you go. We don't need to visit no desert mining tons of sand and smelting it, even though we did recently create a super smelter. But in short, that farm is going to supply us with all the bottles that we need for our potion brewer. The next trick is filling them up with water. Unfortunately, this bit is easy and puts us really close to being finished with this project because the next thing we'll do is a test. But first of all, let's explain what's going on here. We're using a comparator to detect if this hopper doesn't have items in it because if it does, it's going to power this redstone, which is soft powering the dispenser. So the moment it doesn't have potions in, which is when we use this contraption, that redstone dust is actually going to turn off and on and then it will be soft powering the dispenser. And it's important that it gets powered that way because it allows items to drain in through the hopper into the dispenser, which for some reason has water bottles in. This must have been from when I first set it up. Ah, that would be because there were some empty slots when I first put items in from above. So here we have a buffer of bottles, which isn't necessary, but it kind of feels nice that it's there. And then next door is where we're going to store our blaze powder. And you can see that's starting to drain out already. I've actually demolished my supply of blaze rods. This is like all I've got left. Anyways, this is now finished draining because all of the hoppers below are filled up with both water bottle and blaze powder. Now, the way in which we feed both of those through the same set of hoppers to these right here is by putting these at the very back. So the first slot is always a priority for water bottles to come through. It's same of the one directly above. And that's because these will feed into the stack below. So as soon as we consume one of these, there's going to be a chain reaction of the item going into the brewing stand and then from above down below. And so we never actually displace these four slots for the water bottles. If you put the blaze powder at the front, everything will break eventually. But as I said, we're now ready for a test. This thing has bottles. It has a blaze powder. Let's get it some ingredients. I should have already picked these up a moment ago when we were at the witch farm. I am just so forgetful sometimes. <laughs> oh my god, we have an insane amount of redstone here. I forgot. I forgot. Uh, Gunpowder was the other one I was looking for. So glowstone is an ingredient. Sugar, that's all gone. Huh. I remember now moving the gunpowder back to my base, but I'm not sure about sugar. Okay, so here's the gunpowder, and I've solved the mystery with the sugar, because witches also drop spider eyes and earlier on in the season i decided i didn't need either of those items but it's okay we don't need a crazy amount of these items and well <laughs> gonna need more than that i have actually already gone around the base mustering up all the different types of ingredients that we're gonna need so we are actually good for now all right let's go ahead and brew up some speed two splash potions I'll admit I'm starting to sweat a little bit but i've done all of the preparation that i can here so well <laughs> Let's go and see this thing in action. All right, ingredients are out. They're going into the minecart. This thing is going to do its laps. All right, this should be the last one. Looking good. Off it goes. And now we can just stand here and wait, basically. The potion ingredients look like they're in in the correct order. They are. And all of the items have drained over to this side of the hopper, so it's going to work absolutely fine. So now's the bit where you just sort of stand around and wait. 
Okay, the gunpowder's about to go down. There it is. That means we'll see a change over here. The items will start going back across to the opposite side. And it's around now. We should hear the brewing sounds. Oh, here we go. Got to wait a little bit longer because of that. Hey, and you saw it, right? The potions went out. The water bottles came in. The thing is ready to go again. Now all of the potions have to drain into this chest, but we do want to create a system where they're going to be in a shulker box and that shulker box is going to be given to the player. But before we do that, a floor deep into the contraption that only now I've discovered. Only I could do this. Fortunately, I think there's a fix, but as I was moving these item frames up by one, I realized that I've been stocking the golden carrots for the invisibility potion in this lane here. So whenever we have a potion that uses a fermented spider eye, like the speed for slowness down the front here, it means I need to put both sugar in this one and this one. I don't know why I didn't catch this sooner, but that's just the way it goes sometimes. Fortunately, I think there is a nice and simple solution. If we put two pieces of redstone dust here, then this dropper is activated. This one doesn't have sugar in. Let's go and just get rid of these bits. And now you can see either one of those that we select with the target blocks through the selector at the front, both power this dropper. And that, my friends, is a very lucky break. And the first one that I showed you is at the gap here in the middle. So we just need like an extra block with some redstone and then we can get rid of this. And there is another one here for the harming potion and those are the three modifications we need to make. So back to the handling of the brood potions, we want to get them to the player and in a shulker box. So we need a shulker box loader that does that automatically. I do need to put a shulker box here. It is currently empty. And because this comparator detecting its contents is on compare mode, it's only going to turn on when it's full up all the way. And when that happens, we have a repeater here powering the dispenser below on four ticks and another one on this side powering that piston. So the piston goes first to break the block and put it into the hopper. And then the dispenser down below places another dispenser and all the items, they come in from the top here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just start moving some of these potions into the hoppers here. And now we have three potions left. Let's chuck them in, watch this thing in action. We've now got a fresh empty shulker box there and this one is ready to be delivered to the player. And now that I've added a couple more redstone elements, I think we're actually finished with this project. So let me explain, there's more hoppers. They're gonna to lead to an elevator over here. This is quite nice and elegant because it's just a bunch of uh, observers that will update when the item arrives in the bottom here and it'll send enough signals for all those droppers to get powered and then a dispenser places the shulker box on the ground. Now when that shulker box makes its way through here it does one other thing which is create a pulse from this comparator that is going to send a signal upwards and arrive at this, the very last thing that I needed to add which is a T flip flop. So when we press this button, we move the block across. So that prevents us from spamming the input and breaking the machine. So around the back here, when the redstone block arrives at this side, it's going to turn on the lamp so that we can see the machine is running. And it's gonna turn on the copper bulb, which starts the whole process. Fortunately though, I've seen the big mistake here. Uh, this thing will actually change twice. We do not want that. So with an observer and a sticky piston, we only create a pulse to change the bulb. When this is activated, when it retracts, it won't do that. And that's it. Now let's brew up some potions. Okay, I stocked this thing up with glistering melons. So let's go for some healing potions. Oh, there's always something, isn't there? These don't work with redstone, which reminds me there are other ones like magma cream that only work with redstone and not glowstone. It's gonna be the same dealio as this, but we need to find the wiggle room to put in an extra two circuits, one that modifies the redstone, one that modifies the glowstone. I, I really thought we were done with this project, but we're not. So I have lost some vertical elegance here, but if we swing around, you can see how sometimes we have to use both sides of these additional conditions, which we activate by pushing the lamps up. So this additional condition makes its way all the way down here and it will turn off the redstone. And the way that we powered this by locking the top dropper is really, really awesome. So let's go and change the potion type to speed and then add redstone so we extend the duration. 
But of course, we have then changed our minds. So we go to the glistering melon and look at this. It turns off the redstone one and I can't activate it again, but I can activate glowstone. Right, so it looks like we're making splash healing two potions. I'm just going to go ahead and hit this button. <laughs> it should all work. Surely now it should all work, right? It's looking like everything's okay. At some point I will accept this, but I think for all future brewing, I'm just going to be constantly coming around here, checking on all of the redstone. Looking good. The brewing has finished. Then the cooldown extension. That does its thing. All the potions are being swapped over. Oh, it's looking good. It's looking good. Okay, now it's about waiting. Oh, th there you go. That thing in action. It's going to send it all the way to the top. Look at this. Our box of potions has been delivered. All right, this time I think I want some wind charging potions. I'm just going to press the button and wait over here. Oh, there it is. Woo. Hey. It takes quite a bit of time. I got to admit, I was getting a little bit of a bellyache then. This works. I, I, I'm pretty confident that this works. And I brewed up a few boxes of potions now, and I think we're good. The contraption, it is finished. But of course, there's still a long way to go. We've now got the incentive to build lots of farms and stock this thing up. There's a case of building some terrain and structure around this thing. And there might be a few more bells and whistles to put on this contraption, like note blocks when it's brewing, so you know something's happening. But the big thing for me this video was breaking the brewer down into smaller parts that I could explain one by one and show you how we link them all together. And that was the goal of this video. So you've got to leave a comment and let me know how I did, if you understand the contraption, if it makes you more confident with perhaps tackling some of your own redstone contraptions now. But yeah, there you go. That's the Brewer Project. Leave a like if you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon with another episode of Hermitcraft. Bye-bye.